Scholars have defined deception in many different ways, but they generally agree that it entails deliberately inducing in another a belief the deceiver knows is false. The communicator's intention is important because an act can be classified as deceptive if the person tries to give a false impression, regardless of whether the recipient of the communication is actually fooled. You should know that I use the words lies and deception interchangeably, even though they might have slightly different connotations. So let's break down the definition a little more, because there are really five components to it. First of all, there must be a deliberate attempt, or it must be intentional. Second, it can be factual or emotional. You can lie about your feelings or emotions, or you can lie about a fact that you know and tell someone something that is false. Third, it can be expressed verbally or non-verbally. You can lie with your words, or you can just lie with your face or your actions. It can be successful or unsuccessful. In other words, you can lie and get away with it, or you can lie and not get away with it, and we would consider both of those deception. And the fifth aspect of the definition is that the deceiver must consider it to be false. Consider the case of sarcasm. If you say something that you know is a lie and the receiver knows it's a lie too, then that really wouldn't fall under the definition of deception. There are many different types of deception, and I'm going to talk about just a few. Some of these are described in the article by Judy Burgoon and David Buller in the list of suggested readings included in this module. I'll give you the sources for my information there, and you can read more about these topics on your own. The first type is what I call a fabrication. This is a complete lie that has no truth to it at all. If you asked me if I played any sports and I told you I was a soccer star, that would be a fabrication because I've never played soccer in my life. The second type of lie is what I'm going to call a half-truth. These are difficult to detect because they might contain some elements of truth which makes them sound credible. Perhaps it's been embellished to sound better and there are parts of the message that you're really just not telling. Again, if you asked me if I played any sports and I said I was a golfer, that's the truth. But I could embellish the truth by saying I played on my college team or that I'm the club champion of the course I play. Or if I really am the club champion, I could minimize my accomplishments by shrugging and saying, yeah, I play golf a bit. The third type of deception is what Burgoon and Buller call an implicit falsification. This is when you give a misleading answer without actually lying. Again, we consider it to be deceptive even though no actual lie is told because the intent of the speaker is to give a false impression. Think about all those weight loss ads you see on TV. They show a piece of equipment or a weight loss supplement that imply that if you just use their products a few minutes a day, that you will look like this. This picture is probably of models or exercise professionals who spend several hours a day working out and eat a very nutritious diet. To suggest you could look like this by just exercising a few minutes a day or taking some supplement is giving a false impression or an implicit falsification, even if they never make any promises. The fourth type I will discuss is what is called an altruistic lie, or what Burgoon and Buller called playings. This can include joking, teasing, kidding, tricking, bluffing, and even hoaxes. Have you ever planned a surprise party for someone? You have to lie to them in order to do it. Altruistic lies are those that are told for the benefit of someone else, like telling a friend they look great even if they're feeling down and they don't really think so. These different types of deception might also have different motives that lie behind them. We lie for a lot of different reasons. To gain an advantage or avoid a punishment. Consider why children lie. My dog ate my homework is meant to get someone out of trouble. We also lie for psychological reasons like to avoid embarrassment. You might tell your boss you have the flu when you oversleep through an important appointment because you don't want to look incompetent. We might also lie to benefit others. These are the altruistic lies we just covered. When asked why they lie to the people they are closest to, a study by DiPaolo and Cashi found that most people say their lies are altruistic. Their lies are meant to protect their partner's feelings, build or maintain their partner's self-esteem, show concern for their partners, and to help their partners attain their goals. We might also lie to win the admiration of others. If I tell you that I'm a golf champion, I might be trying to make myself look more skilled than I really am. We might also lie to exercise power over others. In a study I did with a couple colleagues comparing the lies told by managers to those told by subordinates, we found that the managers often withhold crucial information from their subordinates in order to display their power. For example, one manager said she had her subordinates working on an important project, 
and didn't tell them when the deadline had been extended. She wanted them to get finished on time, and so she gave them a false deadline to make sure they met the real deadline. We might also tell lies to maintain privacy, like giving a false name in an online chat room if you don't want your confidentiality to be broached by others in the room. We might lie to have fun. You might play a prank on someone or engage in a hoax to have fun or gain notoriety. For example, Mark Knapp tells of the story in a 1995 film that aired on Fox called Alien Autopsy. Many people believed that the alien autopsy was real. It was purportedly the autopsy of a real alien found in the wreckage of a UFO that crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. It was sold to broadcast networks and shown in over 32 countries. In 2006, the filmmaker came forward and admitted that the film was a fake. He used canisters of old film to make it look old, but it was a complete fabrication. Other hoaxes like the creation of crop circles or the sighting of the Loch Ness Monster have been harder to undo than alien autopsy, but they've certainly achieved their goal of making the hoaxers famous. So we've discussed some definitions for deception, the different types of deception, and the motives behind the deceptions that we engage in. But why should we really study deception? What's the point of taking a class in deception detection? Every culture in the world places a high value on honesty and trust. When you ask people to list their characteristics of their ideal mate, trustworthy is near the top of the list almost every time. And yet people use deception to get ahead, to gain an advantage in a competitive world, and to impress people. It's a paradox that we simultaneously value honesty and yet reward deceptiveness. Understanding human deception and the reasons behind it can help us learn why people deceive, how to discourage deceptiveness, and encourage ethical behavior to catch liars whenever we can. Deception impacts every message we process, because even when people are telling the truth, we might think they're not. Credibility assessment is something that undergirds almost every interaction we have. You need to understand deception in order to be a savvy consumer. How do you know when a company is making false claims about a product? How do you trust the messages that salespeople send? Consumer protection is an important reason to study deception. Also, we're in an institution of higher learning. The university is a place where people seek knowledge and truth. And yet some surveys of undergraduates suggest that as many as 90% admit cheating at some point during their academic careers. You've heard stories of professors faking their credentials or journalists plagiarizing the work of others. In order for academia to maintain credibility as a place to seek truth and for researchers to investigate the real answers to problems, it must also be a place for ethical communication. Do you think there's a danger in teaching a course on deception? Aren't we just creating better deceivers? What if people come to this class in order to become the perfect con artist? There's always a risk that science will be used for evil. We'll be discussing this very question as we discuss the ethical perspectives of deception and try to create an awareness of the harms that deception can cause. I believe that being more critical of the message you see and hear will help you understand deception better and be a better relationship partner, a better student, a more discerning consumer, and a happier person. So use your powers for good.